In today's podcast, I would like to talk about a rather complex and relevant topic, social networks and their impact on us. I consider myself an early adopter. I quickly joined every social network that emerged and was quite active on them. However, Instagram was an exception. I only registered there in 2016 when I finally had a reasonably decent phone. And I was already 26 at that time. Once upon a time, the appearance of social networks for people of my generation seemed like magic. A unique opportunity to share what's happening in your life and instantly receive reactions from friends who are quite away. There was a lot of positivity and joy in that. And looking back, I wonder where it all went. Why social networks now associate with negativity for me? And what's truly phenomenal is that it didn't take long for everything to change. I've had moments of quitting social networks, completely deleting my Instagram account, reducing my content consumption. I began consciously questioning why I need this unnecessary information from people I don't even know. I hardly scroll through my Instagram feed or watch reels anymore. Yes, I'm still seduced by shorts on YouTube and I'm working on that. As for TikTok, I'm only following useful accounts like marketers, psychologists, alcohol recovery coaches, and so on, in educational content, so to speak, that doesn't lead to endless scrolling. I also enjoy reading Telegram. There are many useful channels there, and of course, podcasts. I discovered podcasts back when Joe Rogan was recording for YouTube. Two years ago, I found podcasts on Google, and now I'm recording my own podcast. Nevertheless, I still believe there are numerous advantages to social networks, especially when you're an immigrant living in a foreign country with many friends and acquaintances living far away from you. In any case, it's better than the times when we could only make a city phone call once a month. Now let's talk about the downsides. Regarding Instagram, I'd like to add that there is hardly anything left to scroll through there. It's impossible to configure your feed to see what your friends are posting. You'll only see recommendations. You need to enable notifications just to see what my friends are posting. It seems like there is just too much forced content. You don't get to choose what content to consume. It's forcibly pushed onto you. So in order to view posts from people who genuinely interest me now, I have to enter their usernames in the search bar and only then I can see and like their posts. Otherwise, my feed gets flooded with useless reels and photos from people I have no interest in. It feels like being pushed into a metro train in Japan. For those who didn't know, all social media platforms have a team of people who work on behavioral mechanisms. They create specific algorithms and design buttons to enhance the functionality of social networks to keep your attention and make it more interesting to be there. Interestingly, these same people often stay away from social media themselves. Now, let me tell you about some of these hooks. Number one, if you're an app, how do you keep people hooked? Turn yourself into a slot machine. The average person checks their phone 150 times a day. Why do we do this? Are we making 150 conscious choices? If you want to maximize addictiveness, all tech designers need to do is link a user's action. Like pulling a lever with a variable reward. Does this effect really work on people? Yes, slot machines make more money in the United States than baseball, movies, and theme parks combined. But here is the unfortunate truth. Several billion people have a slot machine in their pocket. When we pull our phone out of our pocket, we are playing a slot machine to see what notifications we got. When we pull to refresh our email, we are playing a slot machine to see what new email we got. When we swipe down our finger to scroll the Instagram feed, we are playing a slot machine to see what photo comes next. When we swipe faces left, right on dating apps like Tinder, we are playing a slot machine to see if we get a match. Hook number two, fear of missing something important. Now the way apps and websites hijack people's minds are by inducing a 1% chance you could be missing something important. If I convince you that I'm a channel for important information, messages, friendships, or potential sexual opportunities, it will be hard for you to turn me off, unsubscribe, or remove your account, because, uh aha, I win, you might miss something important. This keeps us subscribed to newsletters even after they haven't delivered recent benefits. What if I miss a future announcement? 
This keeps us friended to people with whom we haven't spoken in ages. What if I miss something important from them? This keeps us swiping faces on dating apps even when we haven't even met up with anyone in a while. What if I miss that one hot match who likes me? This keeps us using social media. What if I miss that important news story or fall behind what my friends are talking about? But If we zoom into that fear, we will discover that it's unbounded. We will always miss something important any point when we stop using something. But living moment to moment with the fear of missing something isn't how we are built to live. Hook number three, social approval hook. We are all vulnerable to social approval. The need to belong, to be approved or appreciated by our peers is among the highest human motivations. But now our social approval is in the hands of tech companies. When a friend, in this case Mark, takes you in a photo, you might assume that he made a conscious choice to do so. However, the passage suggests that the social media platform, for example, Facebook, can influence his or this behavior. For instance, Facebook can automatically suggest to Mark that he tags you in a photo by showing a prompt like, tag Jules in this photo. This means that when Mark tags Jules, <laughs> he might be responding to Facebook's suggestion rather than independently deciding to tag Julia. These platforms make design choices to influence user actions. For example, when you change your profile picture, It's a moment when you might be seeking social approval, wondering what your friends think about your new photo. Facebook can use its algorithms to rank such updates higher in your newsfeed, ensuring that they stay visible for a longer time. This in turn encourages more friends to like or comment on your new profile picture, keeping you engaged and coming back to the platform. By manipulating these interactions, Facebook and similar platforms can control the multiplier effect for how often millions of people receive social approval from their friends. When you see friends liking or commenting on your posts, it can be psychologically rewarding and encourage you to continue using the platform. That's why it's so important to recognize how powerful designers are when they exploit our vulnerability. Hook number four, binding your reasons with their reasons. When you initially open an app, you often have a specific reason or task in mind. For example, you might open a news app to catch up on current events, a social media app to check messages or post updates, or a productivity app to complete a task. Apps especially those that rely on advertising or subscription-based models, have a vested interest in keeping users engaged within the app for as long as possible. This engagement often translates into more ad views, more content consumption, and making people purchase premium features. For example, in the physical world of grocery stores, the number one and number two most popular reasons to visit are pharmacy refills and buying milk. But grocery stores want to maximize how much people buy, so they put the pharmacy and the milk at the back of the store. If stores were truly organized to support people, they would put the most popular items in the front. Another example is my own experience with the Flow app. I use it to track my period of ovulation predictions and so on. However, as I navigate through the app, I notice a significant presence of ads. At the bottom of the screen, a persistent banner ad takes up available screen space. This ad can be skipped, but it disrupts my experience. I initially opened the app with a specific goal in mind, tracking my menstrual cycle. However, the abundance of ads makes it challenging to concentrate on my primary task. In such scenarios, users often consider purchasing a premium version of the app or exploring ad-free alternatives to regain a more focused and ad-free experience while using the app. Are you upset that technology hijacks you? I am too. I've listed a few techniques, but there are literally thousands. Imagine whole bookshelves, seminars, workshops, and trainings that teach aspiring tech interpreters techniques like these. Imagine hundreds of engineers whose job every day is to invent new ways to keep you hooked. By the way, I've just completely turned off all notifications for likes, follows, and so on. I don't understand why I didn't do it earlier. 
When I realized that scrolling through my Instagram or TikTok feed was neither relaxation nor beneficial for me, I decided to stop and started my own TikTok blog for others to scroll through. The more you succumb to social media with all notifications turned on, the more frequently you refresh your feed and the fear of missing out grows the harder it becomes to focus on important work. Of course, it's easier, more fun and more dopamine inducing for your brain to swipe through the feed because our brains love comfort. If you were looking for an answer to how to stop procrastinating, I'll give you an answer. Reduce your use of social media. If not 100%, then limit yourself and minimize the amount of time you spend there. I don't want you to consider this podcast as hatred towards social media. No, not at all. I love social media and I enjoy evolving within them. I think the problem with social media arises when we don't even realize what we are consuming. When we simply allow information to enter us without filtering it. For example, I watch a lot of YouTube. You can find information about everything there. How to edit videos on Premiere Pro, numerous videos for home workouts, how to advertise on Instagram, how to combat a bad mood. Even on Instagram, if you look, there are accounts that inspire me for new videos or photos. It's essential to understand whether social media sets you on a positive note, gives you a kick to start working, inspires you, uplifts you, provides new ideas, or whether you just wasted 15 minutes of your time in vain. Unfortunately, most people live on autopilot. And social media now play a very unfair game. They don't protect the consumer. They scan your phone thoroughly, what articles you read, what you like and what you scroll through. The most frustrating part is when I see a person with whom I haven't had much interaction and then I see them everywhere in my recommendations. What's also annoying about social media is that there are so many unnecessary features. You're trying to find the function you need, but you get lost in a sea of unnecessary functions. My mom constantly complains about Facebook and Instagram, so she doesn't even follow my content because she simply doesn't want to deal with all these features. It frustrates her. It's impossible to set any function in these social networks to use them with pleasure or even without irritation. I also want to discuss the issue of comparing oneself to others on social media, where you feel like your life isn't as beautiful as what you see on other people's Instagram pictures. Oh, that's my sensitive spot and I want to shout about it. Recently, I've become more active in social media and I consider myself a blogger. I always believed that I needed social media for self-promotion. If I'm not on social media, how will I share my ideas? After all, a blogger is supposed to be on social media. As I mentioned earlier, there are profiles that motivate and inspire me, giving me new ideas. And there are profiles that demotivate me, making me feel a loser, uh, like my life isn't worthy. So the first thing I did to stop comparing myself to others and underestimating my own life was to reassure myself that I don't really know what's happening in other people's lives in reality because it got to the point where I engaged in self-destructive behavior and undermined my own significance. Of course, everyone posts only the best things happening to them, nothing bad. When you realize this, it becomes easier to accept your own life. Furthermore, if I visit a blogger's profile and see that they have more subscribers, views, likes, and in general their life seems to be a fairy tale, I start envying them unintentionally. In such cases, I either unfollow that person or mute their stories and posts. I don't encourage myself to follow such people, and as long as I follow these rules, I feel less anxious and avoid comparing myself to others. I also don't try to portray myself and my life as better than they are. In my posts, I write about depressive episodes, fears, failures, and experiences. Of course, I don't only write about the negatives, because that would also demotivate people instead of inspiring them to strive for something good. Because if I start showing and writing only about the happy moments in my life, the gap between my real life and what I post would become so enormous that I would start disliking myself. Therefore, I often showcase on social media those things that I'm af often afraid to show, especially when I feel very vulnerable. Now, let's summarize. Lately, my principles have become very clear. 
Social media has started to negatively affect me personally. They distract me from work, don't allow for proper relaxation, and scrolling is not relaxation, it's more like a guilty pleasure. Recently, in moments when I need to focus, whether it's studying Spanish, writing posts for Instagram or scripts for podcasts, I simply switch my phone to airplane mode and take it to another room, limiting myself to the maximum. Right before your eyes today, I even turned off yet another seemingly important notification for likes and follows on Instagram. I hope this podcast has been useful and motivating for you to also turn off notifications or put your phone away to be more productive. If you enjoyed it and found the content valuable, please consider giving it a five-star rating and sharing it with your friends or followers. Your support helps me reach more people and continue to create content that can make a positive impact in our lives. Thank you for tuning in and until next time, stay productive and inspired.